Did you know there is a medieval style castle less than two hours away from downtown New York? That's right, off the shores of the Hudson, on a small island, lies Bannerman Castle. The man behind this impressive structure was Francis Bannerman VI, who dedicated much of his life to building the castle. However, his story is also marked by tragedy. It's said that the island where the castle stands is shrouded in a mysterious curse believed to be responsible for the misfortunes that we will cover in this story. From murders to explosions and accidents, the island and its castle have witnessed horrific events. So join me as today we discover the history of Bannerman's Castle. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. To delve into the history of Palapel Island, let's transport ourselves back to the 17th century. Approximately 51 miles north of New York City, and situated 1,900 feet from the banks of the Hudson River, eastward bound, this island spans roughly 6.5 square kilometers and is predominantly composed of rock formations. Before the arrival of European settlers, Palapel Island served as an abode for Native American tribes who inhabited its shores and navigated its waters. Then, as European explorers ventured into the region, the island piqued interest as a potential site for settlement and trade. When the Dutch settlers were exploring the region in 1624, they stumbled upon Palapel Island nestled at the north gate of the Hudson Highlands. The name Palapel Island connects deeply to its historical narrative. Originally known as Palapel, it is believed to stem from the Dutch term Paul Opel, translating to pot or cauldron. This intriguing etymology alludes to the island's geographical features or function as a gathering place for early settlers. Now, geographically, the island occupies a strategic position along the Hudson, making it a focal point for military control and trade during the colonial era and the American Revolution. Throughout the American Revolution, Palapel Island emerged as a crucial strategic outpost. The island's fortifications served as a vital military base for storing ammunition and monitoring the Hudson. Its privileged position afforded commanding views of the surroundings, enabling effective defense strategies and communication with nearby garrisons, and hence its role was pivotal in the conflict. In fact, in 1777, wooden supports filled with metal-tipped logs were placed in the river 15 feet away from the island. These artifacts were designed to puncture the hulls of warships attempting to navigate the Hudson. However, they proved ineffective as a fleet of British barges advanced through the barrier and headed towards Kingston, where soldiers raised the then capital of the colony, New York. With that in mind, suffice it to say that the history of Paul Pell Island underscores its significance in military and commercial conflicts, tracing all the way back to the founding days of the United States. Yet few would have imagined that these early events, both in trade and warfare, would profoundly shape its destiny, thanks to one man whose business-minded vision made him the king of the arms trade. Francis Bannerman, a renowned merchant and arms expert, was born in Dundee, Scotland on March the 24th, 1851. He immigrated to the United States with his family in 1854, settling in Brooklyn, New York. Then, in 1862, Francis's father, who was dedicated to buying and selling at Navy auctions, imparted his knowledge to his son before enlisting in the Union Navy during the Civil War, leaving Frank in charge of the family business at just 12 years old. It was this early business experience and responsibility he assumed from a young age that laid the groundwork for Frank's career, influencing his mindset and approach to trading weapons. After the Civil War, the U.S. government had surplus military supplies and auctioned them off as scrap. Francis quickly bought up all the swords, cannonballs, pistols, and bullets that he could find. He soon realized he could make more money by selling the items for their original use as opposed to selling them as scrap. So by age 20, the young scrap merchant was already a very successful seller of used weapons. Francis had considerable capital upon his father's return from the war, allowing him to start his own business in 1872. He opened his first store at 43rd Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, and as the company thrived, Bannerman expanded by opening several stores to meet the growing demand. 
Over the years, several stores were opened, but the most notable was the one at 501 Broadway, spanning almost an entire block and offering 40,000 square feet of space. Over time, fueled by his strong interest in weaponry, Bannerman built an impressive business filled with historical antiques that also served as something of a museum. But little did he know that he was about to make a purchase that would change his life forever. The Spanish-American War was a military conflict that began in 1892 between Spain and the US. It unfolded on multiple fronts, including Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. As a result of the war, Spain lost most of its colonies in the Caribbean and the Asian Pacific region, while the US emerged as a global power. After the war, Francis acquired 90% of the captured military material, which included a large amount of black powder, said to be the equivalent of 30 million rounds of ammunition. Although lucrative, this posed a significant problem. You see, local residents in Brooklyn, where he had his warehouse, were rightfully concerned about the risk of an explosion near their homes and businesses. So he needed to find a safe place to store them away from the urban center. It was around this time that Frank's son David discovered Paul Paul Island in the Hudson River during a canoe trip. He immediately went to tell his father, suggesting it as a possible solution to safely store a large amount of powder. Intrigued, they decided to investigate further only to discover that the island had owners, as well as a deep history in the evolution of America. I should also point out that it had a legend dating back to long before Henry Hudson ever explored the region. Around 1609, Henry Hudson, an English explorer, extensively navigated the river, allowing Europeans to become more acquainted with the region. Despite Hudson and his crew recording their journey to the river's source, they had conflicts with local natives. It was said that Native American tribes believed the island to be enchanted. European sailors didn't trust the natives, and in one encounter, violence resulted in the death of one crew member. These misunderstandings and tensions contributed to a negative perception of the natives whom European settlers had labeled as, quote, savages. As Dutch exploration expanded, new superstitions emerged about ghosts and goblins inhabiting the area. But to be fair, more factually speaking, the waters around Palapal Island are said to be dangerous and treacherous. Unfazed by the superstition and legends, Bannerman was confident it was the perfect place to store his valuable goods, including the problematic black powder. And so it was. The Bannermans purchased the island from the owners, Thomas and Mary Taft, on December the 5th, 1900, paying $600 in cash and taking out a $1,000 mortgage. The original owners stipulated that the island should not be used to sell alcohol, which was a joint restriction at the time. Given Bannerman's support for prohibition, this was not an issue for him. However, we now know what they couldn't. The island's purchase combined historical myth with practical necessity, shaping what ultimately would become the Bannerman's legacy. During his shopping trips across Europe, in the British Isles, Bannerman was always enchanted by the castles he saw. In 1901, inspired by a Scottish fortress, he set out to build his own back home on the island. This castle would not only serve as a secure repository for his extensive arsenal of ammunition and explosives, but also as a summer home for his family. The project was carried out by locals and workers without assistance of professional architects, resulting in a unique and picturesque style that reflected Bannerman's personal vision. After clearing the island, a dock was quickly constructed, which became a key access point for materials and project personnel. A small house was then erected for the superintendent overseeing the island's transformation. Bannerman turned his warehouse into a giant billboard, displaying his company's name in four-foot-tall letters to attract even more attention. Reading Bannerman Island Arsenal, along with the company's Manhattan address. At its peak, Bannerman Castle was primarily used to store weapons and ammunition, supplying equipment to various countries and armies. Anyhow, it was also a location to manufacture refurbished sporting and military rifles by combining the best damaged pieces from the company's arsenal. By 1905, business was booming. Hence, both more storage space and better docks were needed on the island. Therefore, they approached the state of New York to purchase 6.5 acres 
of underwater rights on the east and south sides. Territorial boundaries were marked according to state regulations, and the harbor and dock were constructed. Plans were then drafted for the second and third arsenals. The harbor dock was characterized by four small towers. The South Gap Tower was located between the island and the eastern shore of the river. To the south and west, a small bridge crossed the harbor entrance between the Twin Towers and the so-called Margarita Tower further west. In 1908, Bannerman built a small house on the island for himself and his wife, from where they enjoyed breathtaking views of the Hudson and the surrounding mountains. Then, in 1909, he designed and built what many considered to be the main castle, the Kraginch Tower. This tower had four similar sides, but with minor differences. A few years later, in 1915, he constructed accommodations for the island's staff, a shop, and the island's only telephone. He also added a gate entrance with a moat and a drawbridge on which he placed his name as well as a coat of arms. With construction nearly complete, the castle was divided into six main parts, arsenals number one through three, the tower and the shelter, as well as the superintendent's quarters. All buildings were made of concrete and red brick from the Hudson River. Some parts had flintstone and cobblestone walls as decoration. Building this castle meant much more than just a weapons depot for Francis. Seeing his vision materialize on an island near New York, a grandeur that was previously unimaginable. This project embodied his ultimate dream, and perhaps that gives meaning to the events that followed, marking a fundamental shift in the family's history. Against the backdrop of World War I, Bannerman's demand for ammunition supplies experienced a notable increase. As a result, the situation aroused suspicion from the U.S. government, leading the Navy's intelligence office to initiate an investigation against him. As part of this investigation, Bannerman Island was seized, and naval personnel were deployed to monitor activity on it for two months, going as far as accusations of treason against the nation. The case was pretty unclear. You see, although he was accused of setting excessive prices for his weapons and selling arms to enemies, correspondence showed that his prices were similar to those previously offered by the Cuban government, which at the time was his supplier, and that treason never occurred. So in the end, Bannerman's name was cleared. He received confirmation from the Department of War, confirming that he did not commit treason. But it didn't come for much, as the allegations against him in the press only escalated as the story was a hot sale. The public pressure caused the government to flip-flop, and then confusion ensued. The War Department kept 24 soldiers on the island for months, suggesting the possibility of danger from Bannerman. However, the Attorney General and the Secretary of the Navy confirmed the absence of disloyalty charges that were previously held against him. Then, the Navy General Staff investigation revealed that Charlie Kovacs, the Austrian administrator of the island, was responsible for initiating the debate on whether Frank Bannerman could be considered some kind of a traitor, a notion which turned out to be completely absurd. Accordingly, Charles was arrested on April the 19th, 1918, facing the possibility of deportation. Although things ultimately ended well for Francis, at least initially, the distress of seeing his masterpiece compromised clearly marked the beginning of his decline, exacerbated by health problems that later arose. Despite his physical decline, he continued his construction work until the end. On November the 26th, 1918, before construction was completed, Bannerman suddenly passed away. He never saw the project he invested nearly two decades in completed. Upon his departure, his sons, Francis VII and David, took over the business. Although this was always the plan and Francis VI hoped that his sons would build their own castles on the island, they chose to live elsewhere. So basically, the construction was completed, and the facility became something of a summer home for the family. This was the result of decades of work, passed into the hands of sons who showed little interest in it. However, something unexpected was about to permanently transform the family's business. August the 15th, 1920, marked a significant milestone in the island's history, when the powder house exploded. The explosion was so powerful that it was felt for several miles, and caused considerable damage. Much of the arsenal stored in the depot was lost during the incident. Legend has it that in a surprising twist of fate, 
Moments before the explosion, Francis's widow Helen got up from a hammock in the residence to have a drink. She had moved in this critical moment as a section of the wall collapsed in the exact place where she had been resting moments before. After Helen died of natural causes in 1931, the family only sporadically visited the island. It quickly became clear that the children had very little interest in continuing the family business, limiting their involvement to a simple liquidation of the inventory. Over time, the company began to decline slowly as its products became more obsolete. In 1950, during a severe storm on the Hudson River, a cargo ship collided with the island, causing yet another explosion that severely damaged the building. This incident and other issues led the two sons to retire from the family business forever. Eight years later, in 1958, all remaining weapons on the island were removed, leaving it abandoned and unused. Like any other building, it required maintenance to survive, and this maintenance would no longer be had. The aftermath of the explosions and the fact that this building was not considered to be designed by professionals soon manifested itself, and the repercussions were abysmal. In other words, the castle had entered a period of rapid decline. In 1959, the tower's roof collapsed onto the lower floor, signaling the beginning of the structure's decay. In 1965, stored supplies were scattered about the island and signs of deterioration were extreme. Later that same year, the ferry that connected the island to the mainland sank, leaving the island uninhabited. Then, in 1967, the island was sold to the state of New York thanks to the assistance of Jackson Hole Reserve, a Rockefeller Foundation. Two years later, on the night of August the 8th, 1969, a fire consumed the arsenal. The alarm sounded when the entire complex was engulfed in flames. Despite efforts, authorities could not contain the fire, reducing most of the structure to concrete and brick ruins. The fire burned for three days, leaving a monolithic ruin and not much else behind. Since then, the river has eroded almost the entire harbor wall, leaving only the towers and the bridges surrounded by water. Exposure to the weather has caused the white paint and siding to fade, and anything left beyond that is covered by vegetation and vandalism. Since its founder passed away, the island has suffered a series of tragedies. Some blame the negligence of his children, who took the reins at the time, while others attribute these problems to the ancient curse. However, even after the withdrawal of his children and in the hands of new owners, the misfortunes continued. Since 1993, Neil Kaplan established the Bannerman Castle Trust, and continuous efforts have been made to restore the island, including fundraising tours since 2004, which have evolved to offer guided tours, concerts, and smaller-scale Broadway productions. Although access to the castle and the large house is challenging, groups of tourists occasionally explore the island with safety helmets. However, the deterioration caused by vandals and trespassers exacerbated the effects of natural wear and tear, as evidenced in 2009 when a significant portion of the castle wall collapsed. Despite these challenges, the island remains a popular destination for urban explorers. Throughout the decades, the castle has witnessed numerous stories, but one of the most intriguing was a tragic event that unfolded in 2015. On April the 19th, 2015, the waters of the Hudson River became the backdrop for tragedy for Vincent A. Viafor and Angelica Graswald. The couple set out on separate kayaks from Plum Point Park towards Bannerman's Island in cold and windy weather. Viafor, not wearing a life jacket or a wetsuit, struggled with his kayak when it began to fill with water and eventually sink. Despite his efforts to save himself, Viafor tragically drowned in the river. In the aftermath of this incident, Angelica faced several criminal charges, including second-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter. However, on June the 24th, 2017, she made a pivotal decision by pleading guilty to involuntary manslaughter. But to be fair, I need to emphasize that many fans of the island don't want to see these dark stories cast a shadow over the island's future. Many still see it as a symbol of the Hudson River. That's why significant preservation efforts have been made, allowing more people to discover and enjoy its magic. 
The Bannerman Castle Trust, a nonprofit organization associated with the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, is dedicated to restoring the ruins of Bannerman Castle and making the island accessible to the public in a safe way. Neil Kaplan, founder and chairman of the trust, has spearheaded these efforts. With the backing of professionals in architecture and engineering, it has been determined that most of the buildings on the island can be stabilized. The trust organizes events and presentations to raise funds and promote the castle's preservation. Tom Johnson, vice president of the trust, has also played a crucial role in creating visual presentations that highlight Batterman Castle's history and significance. The team also published a book in August of 2006 containing nearly 200 vintage photographs and documents of the island's growth and decline with the proceeds dedicated to the trust initiative. And let's just hope they're not too late. As the castle approaches the point where restoration is no longer viable, some consider simply leaving it in its current state, perhaps accepting its history, as well as its ultimate demise. And that's the story of Bannerman Castle. If you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing or clicking join to support the channel. Otherwise, until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off. And I bet none of you suspected that I've got a temperature in the flu right now, <laughs> did you? All right, that's it.